Hello and welcome to season three, episode number 10 of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa. I'm your host, Christina Hagen, coming to you live from Cape Town. And now uh, onto the main event. Tonight we are joined by um, expat South African Jonathan, or Jono Handley, who works for the Marine Program at BirdLife International in the UK. Jono's role in the team is to support relevant stakeholders with the identification of important areas at sea for seabirds, and then assess how many potential stresses to these areas might be reduced, prevented, or eliminated, with the end goal being to achieve a system where nature and people live together in greater harmony, more equitably and sustainably. I, on a personal note, I've watched Jono's work with great interest and respect over the years, and I'm very excited to see what he has to say. So, Jono, over to you. Good evening, Christina. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for those really kind words and that great introduction. Um, yeah, it's a real treat to be here with the team and a real great opportunity to present on the conservation conversation series. Um, looking forward to it. Great, thanks so much. Um, again, great opportunity to be here with everyone this evening. Um, I'm really looking forward to telling you the story about some of the work that we've been doing in collaboration with a very broad network of collaborators trying to understand how we can better support information around the marine protected area network in Antarctica, where we're using penguins as one of the key messaging species to tell an important story about this really amazing and really unique environment down in the bottom of the world. So before I jump into the story of penguins and the story of Antarctica in particular, I thought it would be great just to reflect on these birds more broadly especially in the run-up to World Penguin Day next Monday on the 25th of April. So we know that these birds are absolutely remarkable. They can dive great depths underwater and they can hold their breath for an incredible amount of time, depths of over 500 meters, which means that at that depth, your lungs will compress to about a 40th of their original size. So if your lungs are the size of a Coke can, that means your lungs will be about the size of a thimble when you're down at 500 meters underwater. Really remarkable what these birds can do. The other fascinating thing about these birds is their colonially breeding nature. We see some of these birds breeding in these massive colonies where there's an absolute cacophony of noise. This is an image from the king penguin colony on South Georgia, an island towards the bottom of the world in Antarctica, and it hosts a remarkable population of these birds. And some of you might have been lucky enough to get a glimpse of some of these remarkable birds on the flock to Marion trip. But for me, this is really a picture that sums up penguins quite nicely. This is a picture of a Gentoo penguin on the Falkland Islands. And here you have this individual bird on the land with the vast blue sea in the background. On the land, this bird must raise its chicks, it must fight off predators, it must survive harsh weather conditions. And out at sea, it must go to find the critical food that it needs, to keep itself alive, and to also keep its chicks alive to rear the next generation of penguins. And so by looking at these birds on land, we can start to see this remarkable connection between both the marine environment and the area in which these birds have come to rely on. Now, just in case you were wondering, I thought it also best to reflect on all the different types of wonderful penguins that are out there roughly 18 species that are currently recognized. And many of us will know the very large emperor penguin all the way down in Antarctica. Some of us might be familiar with the much smaller little penguin found mostly around Australia and New Zealand, which weighs around one and a half kilograms. And then there's a whole bunch of marvelous different species in between those two. But just as there is diversity in these species, there is also, unfortunately, a diversity in threats that many of these birds are facing. And they range from both marine and to terrestrial threats. Now, climate change is clearly one of the threats affecting almost all species. Some species we're seeing negative consequences almost in this very day and age. And others projections are that they'll be affected much more in the future too. In the marine environment, some of the main threats are overfishing, bycatch, and pollution. 
And some of you might have seen the devastating oil spills in Peru most recently, affecting some of the humble penguin populations there also. And then in the terrestrial environment, we have things like disturbance and invasive alien species. And there again, some of you might have seen the fantastic work being done by the Gough Island eradication team, where they're looking to eradicate some of these invasive species to protect some of the penguin population. And that's an amazing piece of work being undertaken by the BirdLife Partnership. So with those threats, that means that unfortunately, some of these species that we've known and really admire are in some of the more severe threat categories according to the IUCN Red List. So here you can see some of these species listed towards endangered and vulnerable. And if you're not familiar with the IUCN Red List, what this list is, is a measure of extinction risk for certain species. And so it's kind of the barometer of the state of nature with different species. And ideally, we don't want to see any species in this category. We want to see them in the less threatened categories um, where we can see populations thriving, being in a really good state. So with that little background to penguins and the remarkable diversity in these birds, let's change tact a little bit and let's go towards the bottom of the world from our perspective. And let's consider this remarkable continent of Antarctica. Now, Antarctica was dreamed up upon, perhaps, by the ancient Greeks. They were aware of this amazing landmass in the north of the world, and they thought there must be another landmass in the south of the world to counteract the forces on, on Earth. And, of course, they were more right than they realized. But it took us quite a while before we started to uncover many more facts about this remarkable continent. Nowadays, we know that Antarctica hosts over 90% of the Earth's fresh water, a really phenomenal thing, all this water locked up in masses of ice in this frozen continent. We also know that Antarctica plays a massive role in regulating global climate. So what happens there affects all of us on our back doors. And that climate regulation is impacted by the global ocean circulation that Antarctica and the water surrounding the colony, sorry, not the colony, it's called the penguins, the continent itself, um, that water surrounding the Antarctic continent and the ocean circulation currents there play a massive role in the broader way the, the oceans work. And perhaps stating the most obvious, Antarctica is really, really cold. So a long time ago, when we first set eyes on this place, many people thought, how on earth can anything survive in Antarctica? It just can't be possible. It must be too cold. But of course, we've come to realize that Antarctica is remarkable, and it really could be perhaps one of the last massive pristine marine ecosystems in the world. It hosts an amazing abundance of life from the massive whales to some of the smaller benthic organisms to the tiny microorganisms, and we continue to learn more and more about this remarkable place every day. But let's reflect. We didn't always know what we did about Antarctica. At first, people set out to discover the world in a new and amazing way, and it was in the 1820s when Fabian von Bellinghausen and his crew were the first to set eyes on Antarctica. So, We've just seen the 200 year celebration of the discovery of Antarctica in recent years. And it really is amazing how much more we've come to understand not only about Antarctica, but the natural world itself since that time. This 200 year mark, just about, also coincides with something known as the IPBES report. And there was one particular report which came out from the IPBES community in 2019, which looked at how interdependent people were with biodiversity and also how impacted, unfortunately, biodiversity has been by people. So we very much now more than ever know that nature needs people and people need nature. But while we have a big, amazing report produced in 2019, actually, 
people have been starting to look at this way people and nature are connected a very long time ago. There was the amazing explorer Alexander von Humboldt. And if you haven't had a chance to read the, read the book yet, The Invention of Nature, which detailed his accounts of the world, I'd highly recommend it. In his book in 1799, 1799, while he was traveling around South America, Alexander von Humboldt started to notice already the impacts from deforestation and from large monocultures, not only for the fact that biodiversity was being affected in these places, but that the people that sort of lived and depended on these areas were also being affected. And this is where I come back to Antarctica. Antarctica is a very unique and a very special place. We have this healthy marine ecosystem protected by ice and its remoteness, but also amazingly by political will, a group of people deciding to protect this place through an amazing effort. We go back to the year 1957, 1958, the International Geophysical Year, which led to this amazing political collaboration. This is also a very special time in our planet because at that time, there was the Cold War going on. Countries were at great tensions with each other. It was great uncertainty across different countries. But amazingly, a group of people got together and decided to sign the Antarctic Treaty, which sets aside the entire continent for peace and science. Now, the Antarctic Treaty at the time was really looking at the landmass of Antarctica. At that time, I guess we didn't really understand the same connection between land and sea as we do now. And so in 1982, we had the development of the Convention on the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, or CAMLA, a similar body that hosts the Antarctic Treaty, which helps manage the marine system around Antarctica. And it's grounded in science, and it generally takes a precautionary approach to management, where some of the main management features that it regulates are the toothfish fishery and the krill fishery, which operate in the surrounding waters, aiming to ensure that populations are sustainably harvested and that no other populations of predators are impacted. Kamlar is quite a unique beast in its own right. There's a meeting, there's several meetings every year, but the main meeting generally happens in October. And currently there's 26 member states that attend these meetings. And any decision that is made at these meetings has to be agreed unanimously. So you can imagine when it comes to understanding how different types of the environment might be managed, these conversations can go on for lengthy periods of time. And one of the key conversations that's been happening in Antarctica really over the last two decades has been this discussion around marine protected areas. And I think it's important to note here, when we talk about marine protected areas here, we're talking about an array of different types of areas that have various opportunities for conservation or management measures within them. We're not only talking about strict protected areas, such as areas like the Kruger National Park, which are largely only for tourism um, and where very few, if any, activities occur. Um, and that's an important consideration when we're looking at marine protected areas in Antarctica and really in general throughout the world. So let's reflect on where we've come to over the last while. We have Antarctica, this mainland continent, and we have these different planning domains around it. The ones in yellow are mostly the ones that I'll be focusing on. We've had many conversations over the years with different groups, and there was a remarkable achievement in 2010 when the South Orkney Islands and Southern Shelf MPA was declared. This is one of the first marine protected areas to be declared in international waters, a really, really remarkable achievement. Then another remarkable achievement happened. We had the Ross Sea region marine protected area. This is one of the largest marine protected areas ever declared. You can see this large area in green at the bottom of the Antarctic continent from the perspective of this map. But what you can also see in this figure on the right is a timeline and 
the slow process of uptake. It took over a decade just about to get this marine protected area put in place and officially adopted. And it took many negotiations at the Camelot meetings and countries coming to agreement. And from those who I've spoken to who attended that meeting and were there on the day when their final marine protected area was announced, it really was a remarkable, momentous occasion where both science and people came together to achieve something great for the broader biodiversity. And around Antarctica, we now sit at this really interesting position because we have several proposed marine protected areas which are being discussed. One in the east, one in the Weddell Sea, where you may have seen the recent um, Shackleton ship that was discovered, the Endurance. One along the Antarctic Peninsula and another in the broader areas of the Weddell Sea where there's a planned planning phase for marine protected area designation. We also have a particular region that's managed slightly differently for the krill around Antarctica. But within these pink planning areas, there's been lots of evidence that's been assessed, but there still hasn't been consensus on whether the proposed MPAs should be designated or not. So we wanted to understand, given this lack of consensus, how else could we evaluate proposed areas in terms of opportunities for ecosystem-wide management? And conservation approaches in Antarctica. And this brings me back to the penguins. These remarkable birds, often considered top predators or upper trophic level predators, sit high up in the food chain and are connected to some of the lower rungs of the food chain, some of the fishery species that are being targeted. So there are also the species that during certain times of year really benefits from area-based management. So we can find opportunities to protect them in ways that we know can work to benefit the population. So when it comes to looking at these particular areas, we want to account for the objectives of the spatial planning analyses and especially the scale at which different decisions might be considered. So what can we do to provide the evidence? Well, some of you in and around South Africa and in and around many other parts of the world might have been out at one of your favorite local spots and you may have come across some of these signs, the important bird and biodiversity area program signs. These signs, the more I even come to understand them, really are remarkable because what they are is a community-led and scientific-led approach of finding out some of the most important places for birds across the planet. They're areas that are assessed against standardized and internationally recognized criteria. And many local conservation groups, that some of you I imagine might be involved then will continue to identify and continue to monitor some of these sites. So it really is a remarkable network of important places that we can understand about birds and broader biodiversity across the planet. And these are the sites that we wanted to consider for penguins in the marine environment in Antarctica. Once you've identified that important place, you also then need to think, what might the risks be? What might, what might we need to try and mitigate against? And in the context of penguins and Antarctica, climate change is one that comes to mind. And competition for resource is another key risk that's being discussed in and around Antarctica. So that's where we focus on mostly, is the competition for resources, because climate change is something that'll take a much broader effort than the particular steps that can be taken primarily at the level of Antarctica and the water surrounding it. So why are we doing this work? Like I said, we want to support many of the initiatives that have happened already. And we wanted to offer new insights into the spatial planning needs around Antarctica using penguins as a key messaging tool. So we focus on Antarctica and the waters that are surrounding it. We look to four remarkable species, the Adelis, the Chinstraps, the Gentoos, and the Emperors. The Emperors and the Adelis having this circum-Antarctica distribution and the Gentoos and the Chinstraps mostly being found around the Antarctic Peninsula. And what's key in this picture on the slide also is that Chinstraps and Adelis feed largely on Antarctic krill, the small crustaceans, and both Gentoos and Emperor penguins 
also rely on this prey item. When we're talking about important areas, we're also focusing on some of the summer breeding period for smaller penguins and parts of the winter period for the emperor penguins. This is a time of the year when the birds generally have a much more constrained range, so they're not going out to sea too far, and so area-based management approaches can be quite effective during these times. So without getting too technical, let's think about what we need to identify a globally important place for these penguins. Fundamentally, we need to understand how many there are, where they might be, we then need to define some form of boundary about where they are. And this can be much harder in the marine environment because the marine system is typically a lot more dynamic than a terrestrial system. We don't have roads, fences, infrastructure to the same extent that we might put a hard boundary on. And once we have that boundary, we want to then ask, are criteria met within that particular area? In this case, IBA criteria. So, Firstly, the population estimate. How many birds are there? A seemingly simple question with a not so seemingly simple answer. You can get out there and you can do ground counts and it's remarkable the ground counts that do exist. But remember, Antarctica is big, Antarctica is treacherous, Antarctica is cold. So doing the counts in other places is going to require the use of some support and some technology. And this is where drones are coming into their own. And we're seeing some really awesome opportunities for drones to count penguins on the ground. Of course, drones can be a little bit limited by windy weather conditions. And so satellites are another really cool tool that we're seeing increased momentum on counting penguins in Antarctica. And some of the most advanced satellites nowadays give us an image where we can have about have a pixel size of about one, one to two foot on the ground. So definitely not as, not as fine scale as some of our cameras, but taking the image from 450 kilometers above, I don't think that's too bad. So collecting all these records is another amazing job that needs to get done. And thankfully for Antarctica, there is a data portal called MAP, which collects all the records from all the counts just about for Antarctica. And it's a really great resource that you can explore if you want to learn more about penguin colonies in Antarctica. So then it comes to where do these birds actually go? We started to get some remarkable insights from amazing uses of technology. But thankfully, we've also come a really long way since we started using technology like this back in the 1970s, where this poor gentoo penguin has got a radio transmitter strapped to its back. And I think it would be very unlikely for that bird to swim any significant distance back then. But we were starting. And thankfully, nowadays, we have new tags that give us information on where birds are powered by the sun and able to relay that information without us needing to capture the birds again. And it really is impressive to see how this technology has progressed and the information that we're learning. So here we have a series of maps for the different species. We obviously couldn't track all birds from every single colony. So from the colonies in blue, we took information about those colonies and we used that information to model where these birds would be. So an estimate of distribution. One of the great things from this type of tool is that you can get outputs of areas used by more birds or fewer birds. So in these maps for the whole of Antarctica, you can see areas in yellow and green used by more birds and areas in darker blue used by fewer birds. So we can start to see some of the areas used in higher abundances. Now, for those of you wondering about, well, what happens if you have different types of counts for different types of colonies? Well, in our analysis, we try to account for that. And you can see that the final border that we use for that boundary is this little line in orange. It's not quite as small as our smallest estimate, but it's nowhere near as big as our absolute biggest estimate. And it is a conservative approach based on four different types of counts. So now let's look at 
all of these sites across the whole of Antarctica applying this method for all the species. At the end of quite a long process of gathering the data, understanding the right approaches, we came up and we found 63 of these different important sites all the way around Antarctica for all the different species. So what does this mean in the context of the adopted and the proposed marine protected areas? Firstly, if we look at those that are only adopted, you can see that in some cases, there's 0% coverage for some species, but up to 50% coverage for other species. So this means, well, what would happen if all those proposed marine protected areas were adopted? And what you can see here is that between 49% and a 100% increase would happen in terms of coverage of globally important areas if those marine protected areas were adopted. So those new marine protected areas could certainly help penguin conservation in Antarctica. And again, that take home, if that network of MPAs were implemented, there could be large gains in terms of marine areas with enhanced conservation and management measures for chick rearing penguins in Antarctica. But I think thinking beyond the penguins, it's also important to consider these results in broader context. We know that the marine protected areas are not only designed for adult penguins, but many other species. And there's amazing work going on to describe that for other species. So we need to look at lots of other different types of data sources. And we also know that there's lots of other important work out there showing just how valuable this network of marine protected areas could be for different species that aren't top predators. But important areas are one piece of the puzzle. We have to then ask ourselves, why do we need conservation and management measures in the first place? What are the pressures and what, why, what might we do about them? And this is where looking at competition for resources and Antarctic krill comes into place. So, the amazing thing about Antarctica and Kamlar is that there's an amazing record of krill fishing effort throughout the waters in Antarctica. We have records from the 70s all the way up until now. And what's happened is as we got better at finding krill, so the orange cells are where there's been krill catches, we've found more and more in some of the areas that are most concentrated by penguin populations. We're catching more and more in those areas. And broadly speaking, we performed an analysis where we wanted to see whether there was a disproportionate amount of krill being caught inside of these globally important areas compared to outside. And the take home was that within these globally important areas, there was a disproportionate amount of krill being caught inside some of these globally important places. And so this is something you might expect where you find the most penguins is probably going to be the most prey that they rely on. And so that's also going to be a place where there might be the greatest intensity of fishing effort. But again, let's put those results in context. What it means is that with the other studies out there, it is pointing towards evidence that for the penguin species, especially the gentoos, adelis, and emperors, there could be this competition for primary prey resources. What we also know from a broad review of many other pieces of science is that overexploitation of resources is one of the most prevalent threats to all species. So we need to start asking ourselves the questions about are we doing the right thing? So let's reflect on the lessons learned from the marine IBA study in Antarctica. Counting penguins is really hard. One of the things we really grappled with in this study was getting the population estimates we needed to perform the analysis. And so it's an amazing opportunity, again, just to say, if you have the chance to get involved in your local conservation groups, you're probably not gonna get all the way to Antarctica, but there's many other species out there that we need support counting. And with that information, we can use that to inform some of the conservation decisions that we're trying to drive. And there's a remarkable amount of technology that will also be out there to help us gather and collate that information that we collect. Another thing is that scale matters. When we talk about important places for penguins, we have to consider where penguins are and we have to consider when they use those places. 
much in the same way we have to consider where certain human activities operate and when those human activities operate so we can make the right informed decisions. The other thing is that penguins are only one piece of the puzzle. Antarctica is this remarkable, pristine environment that is home to many other different types of critters out there from big to small. So let's think about all the pieces of the puzzle when we're looking to make those informed decisions about the marine protected areas. Then again, we have much to learn still. We have much to learn about where different birds from certain colonies might go at a more fine scale, particularly for some of the younger birds like the juveniles and particularly from the non-breeding periods. We also have to understand how birds move between colonies to a greater degree. And one of the key pieces of work that people are also doing around Antarctica is continually refining ways that we count penguins, both on the ground and also with new technology. And it's really exciting to see again what's happening with drones, and what's happening with satellite imagery as we move forward. So using the data and the evidence from our work, what does it mean for management actions in the Southern Ocean? Again, we can highlight the message again of how climate change will be affecting some of these species, but action is going to happen really beyond the scale of Antarctica as well as at the scale of Antarctica. Reducing other pressures, one of the key ways that we can do this, and one of the ways that we know this work is through spatiotemporal management zones. This is one of the key places on the Antarctic Peninsula where some of this work is being, or some of these opportunities are being discussed, where we have these general protection zones being considered in green, and then potential krill fishery operations in pink. One of the other aspects that is getting increasing or that is becoming increasingly recognized as an important factor to consider with marine protected areas is how we look at these ecosystem benefits while also considering the social costs. Now, that's a really important lesson to consider both at the scale of Antarctica and also beyond for other marine protected areas. And then let's reflect on the fact that Camelot decides to operate on the best available science. That is one of the ways that Camelot was devised was to operate on the best available science. So when we look to Antarctic biodiversity, we know that this is a remarkable place and we know that Camelot operates on the best available science. And what some authors are saying is that Antarctica and its biodiversity could be deemed to be facing discernment Theresis, which means that where there's a lack of appreciation of evidence, as there has been elsewhere, this could lead to irreversible changes before we've had the opportunity to act on the best available science and the knowledge that we've had already, or the knowledge that we've got already. So we've got lots of really valuable lessons that we can learn from elsewhere. This message has been recognized already as far back as 1799. How can we take this information that we have now and use it to make the best and most proactive informed decisions for the management of Antarctica. This is a key piece of work that supports that question. And so with that message, I'd again just like to say a massive thanks to all the people that made this work possible. The Pew Charitable Trust was a really awesome supporter for us. And they continue to advocate some of this messaging at Camelot meetings. The scientific community behind us, and again, a big thanks to BirdLife South Africa for having this great platform, Conservation Conversations, for letting us talk to you guys about all our important work. And if anyone has any questions or suggestions, um, I'd love to take some and love to hear your thoughts. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks very much, Jono. That was a very fascinating webinar. And yeah, you, you and your colleagues have been doing some important work down there. Um, in South Africa, we're just starting with our attempts to, to identify marine IBAs. So we have a lot to learn from you guys. Um, you guys have got a good team down there, so that's great also. Yeah, yeah, we do. We do indeed. Um, yeah, so please remember to, to put your questions in the Q&A box if you have any questions for Jono. Um, while we wait for some to come in, um, I just so want to stop my share for now. Yep, so I keep my share, Christine. Yeah. 
Um, I, I wanted to also just let people know um, when, when you were mentioning about uh, counting penguins, about the um, Penguin Watch project, um, which uh, gets uh, citizen scientists to, to count penguins that, um, from images that they've captured on camera traps. So I can post that link in the, in the chat box. It's quite a cool project where you, you get to contribute to some important science going on. Are you, do you work with the, the Penguin Watch guys? I don't work with the Penguin Watch guys directly, um, okay. but I've had lots of fascinating conversations with them. Mm. And um, I meant to, I, I thought about getting that link available for the chat beforehand. So mm -hmm. I'm glad you, um, I'm glad you pulled it up. I know um, friends of mine that are teaching also have used it in some of their classrooms. Mm. Um, so it's a nice opportunity for those at home to get involved and also for anyone that's teaching or if you have any other sort of community groups that you work with. Um, it's a really nice tool to to bring into the classroom and into the kind of learning environment where you can learn more about it. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I've just posted you. the link now. Um, it's a great if you have a few minutes to go and count penguins, although it can, <laughs> can be more than a few minutes. <laughs> uh, I often get sucked in. Um, okay, so we do have a few questions coming in. Um, so Marty Jasper asks, uh, please tell us more about the micro tracker unit. It looks so tiny. How much does it cost? How much does it last? Okay, so the micro tracking unit that I showed you is of a new device that works with um, called the Icarus network of tracking devices. And um, it weighs about five grams. I don't know how much it costs off the top of my head, but the unique thing about this device is that it has a solar powered charger on it also. So the device in theory can last for a really long period of time as it's recharged by the sun. Um, the other thing that's really cool about the device is that it effectively has all the technology that's packed into your smartphone inside of it. So not only does it have the GPS, but it also has the accelerometer in it. So things like the step counter in your phone is packed inside of this device. And that information can then be relayed by a satellite to people working remotely. And you can download the information to find out where your animals are going in real time. So yeah, it's a really awesome new bit of technology that is broadening the types of birds we can track across the community. Yeah, it's amazing what um, devices are out there now and how, how quickly things are progressing. Um, so Ray Lazarus asks, um, kind of going back to basics, uh, saying he had no idea that krill was fished for. So what is it used? Uh, what, what, do, what do they use krill for? Sure. So one of the big things that krill is being used for is um, as, as, a, as a feed for some of the aquaculture industry. Um, and it's also being used as a um, supplement in some of these dietary supplements, um, some of the proteins from the krills. Okay. And linked to that, uh, John Rogers asked, um, which countries are doing all the, all the krill fishing? Do you know? Um, so some of, the, some of the bigger countries that are fishing krill um, are Norway, Russia, um, Japan, and the top of my head, I'm probably missing a few. It's, it's six or seven countries that have been the largest krill fishing nations in Antarctica in the last few years. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah. Um, and again, linked to the krill fishing, Michael Potts says, well, firstly, thanks for a superb webinar. And uh, are the countries involved in the Antarctic assisting in policing against overfishing for krill? Um, so I guess maybe that links to how how Camelon uh, works and how, how that, maybe you can say a bit about how Camelon manages the krill fishing. Sure, sure. So Camelon tries to manage the, the krill fishery through a proportionary approach. And they've estimated that 1% of the stock can get taken each year. 
And so vessels that operate within Kamala waters can apply for licenses to catch certain amounts of krill. And then in terms of policing, because you pay to, to because effectively pay to fish in those waters, the system is to an extent self-regulated. So other fishing vessels will effectively tell on other boats that aren't supposed to be there. Um, and so the distance and the isolation is a buffer, but also there is a buffer from other fishing vessels trying to prevent those that aren't paying and those that are bad actors. Um, but there have definitely been instances in the past where illegal fishing has gone on. Um, and it is a, a challenging process to police it sometimes in such a massive area. Yeah, I can imagine. And it's so far removed from most coastlines where there are, you know, coast guards and, and people to patrol uh, the areas. Yeah, yeah. Um, staying with the theme of, of the krill fishing, um, Janet Bloom asks, uh, what has the impact on um, other apex predators above penguins um, being in the proposed protected areas? Are they also adversely affected by the krill industries? So one of the things that's been tricky has been studying some of those other apex predators to the same way we've been able to study penguins. Because penguins have that unique link to land, we can monitor population levels to a greater degree. We can also monitor some of the sort of um, subtler parameters, if you want to call them that. So how, how much a penguin is able to bring back food to its chicks or when penguins start to breed. Um, so we have kind of shorter term indicators of how birds might be affected by changing environmental conditions. So we know more about how penguins are impacted and um, we know less about how some of the other apex predators are impacted. But we do know from other systems around the world that when a certain prey species is removed to a greater degree, then it can have an impact on those populations. And so that's where that precautionary principle to management is really coming into play in Antarctica. We have this opportunity to learn from lessons elsewhere. Um, and it's more a question of do we act now in a preventative way and continue to monitor or do we let things run their course and then try and retrospectively change things? Yeah, exactly. And, and one of the um, kind of, I guess, benefits or, or one of the things we've learned from penguins is that they, they are indicator species. So by monitoring them, we can get an idea of what's going on with, with other predators in the area. Um, yeah, yeah. So from our CEO, Mark Anderson, um, asking about Antarctic tourism. Um, I don't know if it's anything you know much about, but whether you have any concerns about the impacts of tourism on penguins and other biodiversity. Sure. So I don't have direct experience with Antarctic tourism. Um, there is IATA, the um, International Antarctic Tourism Operators Association. And from what I understand, they do have fairly strict protocols in place, which is great. I've heard, generally speaking, very positive things about those protocols. Um, there's a challenge around Antarctic tourism in that if you are a non camelar member state, some private vessels can also effectively just visit parts of Antarctica at will and don't necessarily have to take the preventative measures um, when they visit places. So sort of controlling for, for disease or sort of any form of invasive species when you're visiting these regions. There um, is, as I understand, sort of a tenfold increase in tourism expected in the coming decades um, oh. as this place becomes more and more accessible. So it is something that will need to be managed very carefully. One of my own kind of, I guess, conflict that I have is how we manage a place without funding. And so obviously tourism brings in an amazing amount of funding and if that funding can be used really well, we've seen lots of benefit, benefits from the ecotourism sector. Um, and I think it will take you know, very experienced people to understand how we can progress 
that opportunity in the in the wisest way possible. Um, so a tricky one, tourism is happening. It's generally fairly well regulated, um, but it's always going to be a question of how we can manage it better um, in the most sustainable way so that both the funds come in to manage these places in the long run, but also the places themselves stay protected. Yeah, and also it's, uh, people will be more likely to protect something that they kind of feel a connection with that they've been to. Um, Absolutely. So tr trying to balance that with the limiting the impact um, that those visits have, um, as you say, very tricky um, and definitely going to get trickier with the, the increase that's projected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, then Marco for sure, sorry if I butchered the, the pronunciation of your surname, um, but, but, but Marco asks um, about, um, did you hear about the results of the penguin counts on parts of the Antarctic Peninsula where climate change did not have a lot of impact compared to the part on the other side of the Weddell Sea where ice was more available? I don't know if you know uh, what Marco's asking about, um, but I'm I'm not sure about the particular study that Marco might be referring to. But what we do know about Antarctica is that certain parts of Antarctica, um, the climate is changing in more extreme ways than other parts of Antarctica. And so for different species throughout Antarctica, some are going to be climate losers and some might be climate winners. And so the Gentoo penguins are one example on the Antarctic Peninsula where we're seeing as temperatures are rising, more ice-free land become available. And so these birds are starting to colonize areas further and further south. Whereas as we're coming to understand more about the emperor penguin colonies, just how dependent they are um, on some of the ice areas for breeding, that's where there'll be concern in the future. So yeah, climate change is having pros and cons for penguin species in Antarctica. Yeah, and yeah, as you say, there will be unfortunately winners and losers and it's, uh... Yeah, I guess time will tell. I think, um, I guess maybe to touch on that, one of the, you know, one of the key things to the Antarctic marine ecosystem is krill. Um, mm -hmm. In one way, Antarctica is kind of unique because it's a, and I say this very cautiously, it's a, a relatively simple system um, in that there's not, you know, some of the complexities we see in other systems. And we know that krill is really, you know, one of the main resources that lots of other predators feed on. We also know that during the winter, the ice plays a critical refuge for juvenile krill. And so what will happen as structure of the sea ice around Antarctica changes with climate change over the years, both in thickness and in um, width, for lack of a better word, as in, as in how far it extends from the continent. That will be really interesting to, um, to understand how the, the broader Antarctic ecosystem will be affected. That winter sea ice we know is a really key component of the krill life cycle into the summer when the penguins during the breeding period are really relying on that resource even more. Yes, um, yeah, the krill really is the, the base of the food chain there and everything just depends on it. Um, so given, uh, that it's almost eight o'clock and um, my internet signal is not so great. I'll just uh, go for one last question. Um, Ingrid uh, says, 63 potential IBAs, why so few? There should be more than 500. So I guess um, I'll kind of modify that question a little bit. Uh, what plans do you have for kind of expanding on this work, continuing the work? Um, yeah, what's what's next? Um, I feel like I want to answer by saying how long is a piece of string? <laughs> um, but and again, it's the kind of that that question of scale. Um, we could have lots of small IBAs kind of all next to each other and have a much bigger number. 
Um, or we could have one massive IBA and just have a single IBA around the whole of Antarctica for all bird species. And so in this process of identifying IBAs, we have to kind of consider the trade-off of what is an ecologically realistic boundary for an area and what is an air, what, what is a realistic boundary for the size of an area that can be managed? And so, um, yeah, getting that, getting that balance right kind of dictates the number of marine IBAs. Um, I think what's also Im important to remember is that the criteria that we assess are trying to look at globally important sites. So when it comes to kind of local scale conservation planning, you might also look at other criteria or other ways of measuring important places for biodiversity. Um, because it might mean, for example, that the birds in your backyard aren't recognized because their population is too small, but they're clearly very important to you or that particular region. Um, so we're trying to look at, in this case, just the globally most important site. So whether it's 63 or, or 500, all depends again on that question of scale that we're looking at there and how well you can hopefully um, enact various management measures in those places also. Yeah, yeah, and that's the key point is, is being able to manage the threats in those areas. Um, yeah. It's all very well knowing that they're important, but being able to, to manage them is, uh, is vital. So I think um, on that note, uh, I think we'll leave it there. I think a lot of people also probably have load shedding coming up at, at eight o'clock. So um, we will uh, leave it there. Um, and yeah, any last words from you, Jono? Just to say again, a huge thanks for the opportunity to chat here. And um, yeah, again, I see, see Mark's comment there. So thanks very much for those, those that comment, Mark. Um, and really what we do for birds really spans well beyond borders. Um, and the collective efforts of many is really only how we get to some of these important bird and biodiversity areas. So let's all band up together as best we can um, and continue doing the great work that everyone's doing. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's great to have uh, uh, um, you on from BirdLife International, where BirdLife South Africa is part of the, the BirdLife family. And it's it's great to, to hear about the work that you're doing um, to conserve these birds. So, Thank you very much. Um, I will leave the Zoom room open so people can put some last few messages in the chat room. But yeah, thanks very much and happy World Penguin Day for Monday. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Christina. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Good evening. Good night. Good night, everyone.